I have been video editing in Premiere for the better part of the last five years. And one constant that I've always bumped against are the mountain of expert settings and recommendations from the internet, over which is better, faster, and more efficient. As my other production schedules have calmed down somewhat, I resorted to trying to re-optimize my PC workstation into a fast and efficient video exporting machine. And uh, the results that I found put me into a bit of a rabbit hole that I had to share with you. What was supposed to be a short, simple vlog has turned into doing multiple rounds of tests and digging through many forum posts and documentation. So I guess here we are in this video where I will be diving deep into the rendering and encoding settings of Premiere and seeing which settings really make the most sense. Before we get into the results, which are in this timecode, let's first have a condensed discussion into rendering and encoding in Premiere. When you press export in Premiere, the project file undergoes a series of pipeline processes with multiple steps. The two relevant steps in our discussion are rendering and encoding. Rendering is the process of constructing a full composite frame out of elements from the project timeline. These can be anything from the video footage itself, lighting and transform effects, motion graphics, and color grading, all of which gets thrown and stitched together into frames that we will all see in the final export. But rendering alone isn't enough. These rendered frames need to be encoded into a video format that the computer could read. And that's where the encoding process takes place. It takes those rendered frames and stitches them into a complete video contained in standard video formats or codecs. This makes it easier to view and share the exported media and facilitates things like compression for better storage management. These two processes are separate, necessary steps in exporting a Premiere project. And Premiere can take different approaches in doing these, software only and hardware accelerated. Software rendering involves the CPU stitching together the composite frames of the video, rendering the necessary assets, effects, and filters from the project timeline. This process is super parallelized, meaning that ideally, almost all cores and threads of a CPU are going to be pinned at 100% usage. If it wasn't, the entire process will be wholly bottlenecked due to just utilizing one core and one processing thread. Software encoding is much the same, except that it deals with packaging the whole video into a codec container of your choosing. This means processing the rendered frames into the parameters of the video format and stitching them all together so that it can be read by the computer properly. It is also usually a parallelized process, which means that almost all compute resources of a CPU will be taken up. This way of rendering and encoding videos has been around and tested for decades, and it has usually been the most stable way of creating a video. But it comes at a cost. Speed. Software rendering and encoding is inefficient due to limitations with the way most CPUs are constructed which is that they are generally designed processors, meaning that not all compute structures of a CPU are necessary for these types of processes. For rendering and encoding, they typically hammer floating point units or FP capabilities of a CPU, which leaves many other parts, notably the integer units, almost untouched. If only there was some sort of hardware that was specifically designed for floating point rendering and encoding performance in mind. All right. Hardware accelerated rendering is the process of using the GPU to help out in rendering the composite frames. In Premiere, it is typically assigned special effects that are specifically designed to be hardware accelerated, as well as the lighting and color grading effects. This can dramatically cut down the amount of time each frame needs to be rendered, since the CPU doesn't have to do all of the bulk work and instead can offload it to the GPU which are typically much more powerful in floating point and much more parallelized due to having many multiples more processing cores than CPUs. While these cores on their own cannot hold a candle to CPUs, they are especially designed to handle floating point instructions and can be packed much more densely, leading to some truly impressive floating point capabilities even for low-end GPUs. Hardware accelerated encoding works the same, but through a different pipeline. 
Instead of using just the GPU cores, Hardware Accelerated Encoding uses fixed function hardware inside GPUs that are specifically designed for encoding and decoding videos only, and only in specific formats. This means that these types of silicons are optimized to do these specific tasks only, which isn't helpful if you're, say, playing a game, but speeds up the process of encoding and decoding videos massively with much more efficiency. How much faster? Well, let's take a look. As always, these are the specs of my PC workstation. Yes, I know the memory is a fairly unoptimized config. I still haven't gone around to upgrading that. But anyways, note how I listed the IGP of the system as enabled. That will come up later. Let's get to the results. After exporting this 2 minute and 32 second project with these settings, I sanitized the results and calculated the exported frames per second each settings yield. And looking at the results, we can already see some interesting details. Starting off with the slowest is, as expected, software rendering at roughly 8.97 FPS or exported frames per second. This is when all the work was done entirely by the CPU alone. What's more interesting, though, is that when we turn on hardware accelerated encoding, we see that the exported frames per second remain within margin of error. What gives? It's supposed to be faster, right? Well, yes, but maybe not. We'll get back to that later. Next up is OpenCL Render Acceleration, which sees us increasing our export speeds around 10.9 FPS, and turning on hardware accelerated encoding increases that to 11.51 FPS, just outside our margin of error. Turning to CUDA, we see a gigantic increase in export speed, doubling our software encoded speed to 22.1 FPS, and then another 29% on top of that when we turn on hardware accelerated encoding. Okay, but what exactly does CUDA and OpenCL mean in these contexts? Well, these are computational languages used by Premiere to render frames on the GPU. Which GPU exactly relies on which renderer you choose, because remember, we have our iGPU enabled. OpenCL is the open standard used by almost all companies, but in this case, it only utilizes the iGPU. CUDA, on the other hand, is a proprietary standard that only works with NVIDIA GPUs, in this case, the GT1030. So choosing the renderer means choosing which GPU does the rendering. And from these tests, we can conclude that the GT1030 is significantly faster than the UHD620 in rendering. But what about the hardware accelerated encoding? Which GPU utilizes that? Well, here the question is much more straightforward. It's the Intel iGPU. And that's because it's the only one with a dedicated video encoder and decoder. QuickSync. NVIDIA does have their own, NVENC, but it's not on the GT1030. So all hardware accelerated encoding is done on the iGP using QuickSync. That still leaves several questions, though. Why are the performance deltas between software and hardware encoding so different between the renderers? We range anywhere between a 30% increase in export speeds to no increase whatsoever. What's the deal with that? Well, after wrapping my brain around this for a solid day or so, what I think is going on here is that the renderer is bottlenecking the encoder in all of the other tests except for CUDA. Let's start with software. You would think that transferring encoding to a dedicated part of the silicon would make things faster. But that didn't happen here. That's not because the encoder is broken, but because the CPU just can't render enough frames to keep the encoder fed, even when it doesn't have to carry the load of encoding the video. What you're seeing here essentially is the raw rendering speed of the CPU, and there's nothing more the encoder can do when it doesn't have enough frames to process. Switching to OpenCL and iGPU rendering, the bump in performance proves that even iGPUs are much faster than most CPU rendering, uh, usually, due to its more folding point and parallel focus architecture. Here we see that the bottleneck becomes the encoding speed of the CPU, and putting that burden on QuickSync gives a small but noticeable increase in performance. Still, it's clear that QuickSync can probably stretch its legs a fair bit more if given more frames. And that's exactly what the CUDA renderer gives us. Even with software encoding, the GT1030 can render at almost 
double the FPS compared to the UHD620 with QuickSync enabled. And with QuickSync enabled to handle the encode in the GT1030, that pulls up to 28.51 FPS, way above the native 23.976 FPS native frame rates of the project, meaning that it can export the video in a speed faster than real time. These numbers may not make sense or be hard to grasp at the moment, but let's do some simple extrapolation. Let's say that you're exporting a 10-minute project with the same FPS and the same complexity, assuming that they stay the same as they are, which is not always the case, we see that CUDA and QuickSync encoding runs at less than half the speed of even OpenCL with QuickSync, and it completely makes software rendering feel like taking forever. Sure, it may only be like a dozen or so minutes, but that adds up with multiple exports if you're doing a lot of them, if you're, say, a professional editor, and you will be saving a heck of a lot of time if you turn on CUDA. And that's about it, really. I just wanted to share with you the process of which I've optimized this PC for exporting videos and to show you how important proper settings can be and how they actually work. After all, time is a valuable commodity and doing everything we can to save that is a worthwhile investment indeed.